morning. Um, thank you, Sandra and the PDRC, did I say that right, for inviting us. This is a great chance for us to get to know you a little better and uh, share a little bit about what um, I'm doing over at the Qualitative Research Program and what David and I have been working on together. Let's go to the next one there. So, we thought we'd spend our time today uh, sharing a little bit about the assumptions of what qualitative research is. I'm sure you all have um, different levels of experience and expertise in thinking around this, so that'll kind of give you um, our perspective in terms of where we're coming from when we talk about what qualitative research is. Um, and then specifically, of course, David will um, share some examples of how qualitative research can be applied in the libraries with, for library assessment. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the new technologies that are out there that can support qualitative research across the entire process. Uh, and then we have some ideas and suggestions for where, uh, if you'd like to learn more, where you can go to get some of those resources. David's going to start us out here. All right. Thank you, Trina. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, I'd like to talk first about um, is about uh, why, to, why libraries could do qualitative research. And this is a graphic that was used in an article called Ditch the Survey, Expanding Methodological Diversity in LIS Research. One of my colleagues at uh, Tennessee, Chris Eaker, our data curation librarian, is doing qualitative work and spent a week at a research methods workshop. And part of their uh, output was, what did you learn in your workshop? And they put together this article that was published in, in the library with a lead pipe. It was talking about the prevalence of survey research in libraries is really skewing how we look at ourselves and what we do. So they were advocating we need to use more diverse methods, including qualitative. So uh, it's a great article, library in the red, uh, in the library with a with a uh, lead pipe. We can get you, we don't we don't have a bibliography. We need a librarian to put together a bibliography. <laughs> yeah, I just remembered what I forgot to do. So anyway, we'll, we'll have a reading list together to share with everybody. But this is sort of um, one of the things that sort of uh, piques my interest um, in qualitative is like, you know, there's, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail kind of thing. So qualitative is uh, more tools in the toolbox. So uh, from the library's perspective, or from mine, I also think about qualitative research methods is not just how to assess libraries, but also how we as librarians can, um, can work with our researchers on our campuses. Because qualitative research, uh, as broad uh, spate of methodologies, is applied across our college campuses. Trina and I worked with a couple of colleagues on a um, sort of a content and, and discourse analysis study of uh, qualitative data uh, analysis software as it was reported in published peer-reviewed literature. Who, who is out there using qualitative research software and where are they publishing? And we were really surprised to see the, the predominance of public health and medicine in terms of people using qualitative uh, research methods. And then if you, I don't know if you can see this too very well, it pretty much goes across the scope. You probably have somebody in every department on your campus who is doing some type of qualitative research and maybe could benefit from uh, knowing more about software and software methodology. So, so I see that qualitative as being two things for our own assessment and also getting to know more about how our researchers are working on our campuses. Now Trina's going to talk a bit more about qualitative methods. So I'm always quick to point out that qualitative methods and quantitative methods are very complementary and in fact mixed methods is sort of the, the wave of the future that's already here in terms of being familiar with different methodologies. With traditional uh, research designs, experimental designs, or survey designs, we're generally looking very broadly across populations. We're either picking a random sample because we want to test variables and be able to generalize to the broader population, or we're trying to get as many people to do our surveys as possible to get a real insight across um, a, a wide group of people. And so to complement that, qualitative research really looks deeply at smaller groups of people in their natural context, in their natural setting. Um, so the researcher tends to go use interview data, focus groups, fieldwork observations to really understand particular settings so that you can affect change or actually solve the problems in that site. So they can, sometimes people look at qualitative research as exploratory to figure out what the real questions are that you can then use that information to design a survey or an experimental design to find out um, 
uh, kind of the more generalizable findings. Uh, qualitative designs tend to be emergent and flexible. You don't always know exactly what you need to do until you start, you actually go in and start talking to people and finding out where the real story is about what's going on at a setting. So unlike uh, traditional designs where you have very strict research questions and you're testing hypotheses, qualitative research can kind of um, ebb and flow as you start to understand what the real problem might be. So the goals are to describe and explain what's going on in a particular setting instead of to predict and control, which is kind of what we're doing when we understand how variables work. We want to be able to predict what will happen next time. Uh, and so in contrast, qualitative research wants to just really understand the kind of whys and hows that's hard to get at with survey or other traditional designs. So we don't take people into a lab or we don't decontextualize what they're saying. We really look and stick with the natural setting and where people are actually doing their work. Uh, and we use multiple methods to do that. Uh, and it's often, it's often um, argued that qualitative and quantitative is actually a false dichotomy and that we should really call it interpretive versus inferential. So with quantitative, with numbers, the reason we have numbers is to do statistics in order to infer the findings. With qualitative, you're interpreting that data. So the researcher is very involved in the meaning making that takes place. Uh, so I kind of like that because you can always turn text into numbers if you want to do something with it. And every number has a story to tell. So you can kind of go back and forth with the data type. But it's really dif the difference between interpretation of the social world uh, versus sort of uh, inferring based on statistical analysis what, you're, what you want to predict might happen next. So those are just a few thoughts about about some of the underlying assumptions of qualitative research. So my, uh, one thing I always like to talk about are what are the research questions that qualitative research methods can answer. And I always tell my students that there's really just two questions, if you really boil it down, that all qualitative research is answering. And the first is, what is happening here? At a very broad stroke, coming out of the ethnographic tradition, you just really want to know what's happening. We often think we know because we have familiarity with it, but until we've systematically collected data and looked at it from a variety of perspectives, we don't always know. And then the second question is, what are, what are people's experience of that? So in a library setting, we want to know what's actually happening by getting, looking at a variety of sources, and then we want to know what people think about it. So we want to talk to them, interviews, focus groups, really take the time to listen to their stories about what's happening there. Uh, and then often, because we're all practical people and we're in practical fields, we want to know if what's happening is working. Is what's happening here what we want to be happening here? <laughs> are, the, are the experiences people are having what we want them to have? So that's sort of the applied side of what you want to be able to then do with the qualitative research findings. So lots of different kinds of interview uh, data types are used in qualitative studies, and it sort of depends on what the research design is that you select. But everything from um, very in-depth, unstructured interviews that can go for an hour or two at a time, to focus groups with maybe 10 or 15 people, to document analysis, looking really carefully at the documentation and the way you codify what you do in a setting and to see what kind of message that's giving can be very powerful to understand what's going on. Uh, pictures, drawings, this building is perfect for qualitative research study because of all of the artifacts and the way things are displayed and laid out, um, says a lot about what's trying to be accomplished in this space. So even looking at how the space is set up. Uh, and of course, net, one of my areas that I really like to do is conversation analysis, where you just go and record people's everyday conversations in context. Uh, so not necessarily pulling them out of the context to interview them, but getting them to agree to be tape recorded, or especially looking at the online interactions that are going on and what's really happening um, as, as business is being done. Uh, trying to see if there's anything else. And then of course, participant observation and just field notes from just sitting in a space and watching for a few hours and taking note of what's happening. So those are all different uh, data types that can be useful. And of course, taking pictures while you're there, video, little video, uh, video excerpts can be useful as well. So um, 
one of the things that I work a lot with people on is to figure out, all right, so if you want to do a qualitative research study, what kind of qualitative research study? And one thing we found in the study that David described where we did this analysis of 700 journal articles, peer, uh, empirical research, is that a lot of researchers just say they did generic qualitative research. Um, and so some people will say that you can just do generic qualitative research, but then other people like me probably would say, well, there's really no such thing as a generic qualitative study because every research design has its own particular assumptions. Um, and so the way we do an ethnographic study is very different from how you would do a conversation analysis study. So ethnography, I know that you all had um, a presentation from the EBSCO folks and they talked about this ethnographic work they did on um, user search patterns. Um, and that kind of comes out of anthropology and it's really looking, taking a cultural lens to understand what's happening um, in a particular setting, but from a cultural perspective. What are the norms, the social norms, the relationships, what's happening there? And that's really characterized by long-term field work often, where you're in the field, um, in, I'm in education, so, you know, like spending time for an entire school year or an entire cycle of action and really understanding what's happening in that culture. Another example of a research design is case study, uh, which David tells me is, is relatively well known in the library world, where you're looking at maybe one user as a case, one library as a case, um, one, I guess, department of a library could be a case. And often you pick the case to study based on its exceptionality. Maybe it's a particularly good or particularly bad case and you want to understand it better. So you want to collect a lot of data and see what lessons you can learn from it. So you've got typical cases, atypical cases, uh, but generally that's characterized by uh, multiple sources of data, um, everything from documents to, f to observations to interviews, um, and it's uh, often a problem-solving uh, perspective. There's, there's, there's a very practical end goal, and you want to look at that case to learn lessons for your own, your own setting. Grounded theory is another example um, when you're interested in a process and how a process works and there hasn't been a lot of research done so you don't know, you don't have a theory to guide your understanding of, for example, uh, searching behaviors on certain um, uh, database sites, you can do a lot of interviews and a lot of watching what people do and develop a theory and that's called grounded theory that then hopefully other settings could take and apply to their practice. So it's a more process, how does this work orientation. Narrative, of course, some people argue that all human experience and everything we know is known in the form of stories. And so that the most powerful data collection is getting people to tell their story or to try to understand people's experience in terms of stories. And so narrative takes that approach by either collecting stories on the front end, written or verbal, uh, or taking a narrative approach to organizing those interviews to understand the story of the experiences that were happening. And then finally, discourse analysis and conversation analysis, which, as I mentioned before, is one of the areas I like the most, which is language-based, and it's looking at how the way that we talk about things creates our reality. Um, and so sometimes people will say things like, well, that's just being politically correct, or that's politically correct language, or kind of minimizes that there is a difference between talking about, for example, um, climate change and global warming, right? So that shifted over the years from global warming to climate change for very specific reasons with very particular intended outcomes and then some unintended outcomes. So when we talk about, so I'm really interested in how we use language to talk about things because it constructs a certain version of the world. Um, and so it's when we're in service professions like educators are and librarians are, how we talk to people and how we use language in the course of doing our daily business can really tell us a lot about the version of a librarian or the version of a teacher that's being created. And then um, what I did next was just try to pick some um, examples of studies in, from the literature. And of course, this was from the EBSCO presentation um, where you have already had a little bit of exposure to how ethnography was used to better understand how um, students are using those resources in their information searching work. Another one I found that was interesting was, um, and David and I have done some work using uh, chat reference data uh, from a conversation analysis perspective. Uh, and this study by Koshik and Okazawa, we're looking at 
the problems, the actual and potential problems that can come up, and we were actually talking at lunch with Sandra about this, that when you're doing library chat reference um, interviews and trying to help people on chat, you can't see them, you don't know who they are, and I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience, and so you're trying to figure out the best way to keep the conversation going and being sure that people get what they need. So conversation analysis has a lot of findings from face-to-face -face talk that can be applied to online talk to see whether those same principles hold or whether they need to be challenged. And I know that um, it, with some of this research that I've looked at, how you start the transaction is really important and it's really interesting to see in that data uh, whether the greeting ritual is followed or not and sometimes the student will just pop right in, but then I've noticed the librarians are generally very careful to say, hi, how are you? And I think it, I think one of the studies really made, showed that it made a difference that the more they felt that the relationship was being maintained, the longer the reference interaction went on. So that's just a, a small example there. And again, if you want to look at any of these articles more closely, we can get you the, the, bibliogra the bibliography. Um, the other one was uh, using grounded theory in identifying the user experience during a search. And so similar to what the ethnographic study was doing, looking at how people were doing searches, this grounded theory um, did a very, grounded theory is characterized by very systematic analyses and it ends up usually with process models like you see on the right where they're looking at the query domain um, of exactly what the actions are that users follow when they're doing particular kinds of searches. And they say that they collected observational, cognitive, and effective data. Um, and I think this one may have used some mixed methods with some uh, survey data and also interview data. This one was pretty cool, using participatory design and visual narrative inquiry to investigate researchers' data challenges and recommendations for library research data services. So here, they interviewed and talked with early career researchers and asked them to actually sketch out how they conceptualize doing research in their disciplines. And up on the left, they just, the, the, the um, scholar who was drawing that said that there's a big chasm between him and the end product. And so everything he was visualizing was how he can get around the chasm to get where he needs to go. Uh, and then on the right, there's a couple of post-it notes where they were wanting more assistance understanding how their scholarship had a reach to their audience. So they were able to use these sort of visual representations um, and focus groups to understand um, what the research process felt like to them, and then that could help the librarians figure out strategies to help them. And then finally, this last one is a discourse study. And what I found interesting, because David and I talk about this a lot, is all the talk about open access and changing the publishing model. And as a faculty member, I knew nothing about what any of that meant until David and I started talking more about it. In large part, I think, because there's a language gap. Like, open access doesn't mean the same thing to professors as it does to librarians. And it took a lot of talking. And so this study does a nice job of showing how the, the way that we frame these debates around open access matters because it's going to create a different impression for those of us who need to learn more about it and they give some recommendations about how the discourse um, might be framed differently in order to reach more people to keep that debate going. And now I'm going to turn it over to David who's going to talk about some of the work they've been doing at Tennessee. Uh, we've been doing uh, some um, qualitative work at the University of Tennessee. Uh, we do have um, uh, quite a few uh, new assistant professor librarians. So we have a new crew of folks really interested in trying to do some different things. So we're just now uh, sort of trying to uh, cultivate a um, community of practice for uh, qualitative methods. So um, here's an example of, of two librarians, uh, Sojourner Cunningham and um, Anna Sandelli, who have put together a whiteboard study. And this is a picture of them at their poster at uh, ACRL last year. And what they've done is they, they pose a question, put it on a whiteboard in the library, and then they let students, whoever wants to, write their reactions to it. And they, they've taken the pictures and they're trying to sort of uh, glean what they can learn from there in terms of uh, how are people creating a community. And they're reproducing the study right now uh, during exams. And uh, Sojourn Sojourna, who is, uh, who is on this side here, uh, you're all's left, um, is now at Richmond. So she is doing at the University of Richmond. She's doing at the University of Richmond asking the same questions that Anna's asking at Tennessee. Then they're going to be trying to put those things together. And um, here's the kind of uh, data that they're working with. And uh, it's a really a challenge. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, right here uh, is the question. My dream, uh, my dream slash ideal library has, and then fill in the blanks. Uh, and then some people, uh, you know, free food. Uh, some people want every book in a PDF. So it's, it runs the gamut. And one of the things that they're discovering is that people are talking to one another on these boards. Uh, and they're actually having conversations. Something that some, one student posts sparks another uh, point. So right now, um, Anna and Sojourna are, are wrestling with all this data that they have and trying to find the right method to bring it together. So um, I'm her mentor, so we're trying to work on some ideas and we're gonna try to see if using some software such as Invivo can help them manage all this data that they have because they have lots of photographs. So it's not just the text that is here, but also, you know, there's information in terms maybe the size of the text or the relationship of, the, of what people are saying one to the other. So it's a pretty rich data set uh, that they have to work on. So, so they're out there exploring and uh, figuring things out because it, um, it takes a bit of um, it's an iterative process there. All right, and uh, this, uh, for those of you who have done chat reference, may recognize this. So uh, this is a transcript from a study that Trina and I are working on with another one of Trina's colleagues who uh, does studies and conversation analysis. We were comparing the uh, chat transcripts between a uh, drug alcohol counseling information site with library chat. In particular, looking at how people use URLs or the roles that URLs play, play in the actual uh, conversation um, in terms of whether they're directional, do they stimulate conversation, or are they thrown out there by the librarian to say, hey, are you still there? Hey, are you still there? Um, so, um, and one of the things that we discovered in doing this chat study, I've, I've been playing with chat data uh, for a few years is that uh, um, I started a, um, a content analysis study of chat transcripts and discovered that there was just so much data it was truly unwieldy. So this is one of the things that I've learned in the process. While there is software out there such as Invivo or Atlas TI that can allow you to ingest you know, hundreds or thousands of chat transcripts, which is what I did, you end up with a pretty onerous task when you start trying to code, understand, and read. So it turns out that if you drill down into things that are a little bit more specific into smaller data sets and learned about the context, uh, it's actually a, a richer source of data. The other thing that I discovered in analyzing the chat data is that it gets dated so quickly. You know, we can do a content analysis, you know, where we can count the frequency of the occurrence of interlibrary loan, library catalog, or something like that in the chat transcript. Well, if you want to see if people are having problems with a website, it doesn't help if the website keeps changing every few months. So I could go back and tell you, oh, these people were having problems with the catalog, and I says, well, that's fine, but that was two iterations ago of our one search, so it really doesn't matter anymore. So again, this big aggregate of data is not as helpful sometimes as, as you might think, but it's still useful when you look at it at a smaller scale in terms of how people are communicating and what we can learn about how well we're talking to our patrons in the chat. Let's see, where are we next? Um, and, then, um, and then in particular, once, uh, once you have your data, I know there are some questions about some of the tools that you can use for the data analysis. And there are a multiple, uh, multitude of digital tools out there, and Trina will be talking about, um, about those. I'll let you okay, go ahead and sure. describe some of these here. Yes, there are a plethora. These are just sort of the big ones that people are talking about these days. Uh, in vivo is out of Australia. It's been around probably the long, well, uh, in vivo and Atlas TI both started in like the late 80s, early 90s. Atlas TI and Max QDA are both out of Germany. Uh, in vivo is out of Australia. Deduce is um, out of the University of South Southern California. Um, from and uh, so it's the American-based one. And Quercos is a pretty new one that just came, that's out of England. And this is just a quick and dirty, one of the questions um, that Sandra said came up was, well, which one do you recommend? And that's a hard question because, of course, it depends on what you want to do. So I'll just briefly sort of tell you my impressions of them. And I'm definitely mo most familiar with Atlas TI. And to be honest, I think people often choose which one based on who around them is using who else is using it. So when I started using it uh, probably eight years ago, I picked Atlas TI because my colleagues at Tennessee were using Atlas TI. It's really hard to learn software when you're the only one using it. Um, 
Atlas TI, I would say, is very much bottom-up, emergent, inductive, sort of a qualitative researcher's software. It does not impose any structure on the data. Um, in fact, when you open it, people get freaked out because it's a blank screen. It, you can't see anything, and it kind of just, it, it's a met the metaphor is it's up to you as the interpreter of the data to figure out what you want to do with it. Yes, right, it's like, okay, now what do I do? In vivo looks exactly like Microsoft, uh, it, it looks like Microsoft Outlook. It was intentionally designed that way to look familiar um, to pr prospective users. They have the market share, so you, they have a lot, you will see a lot of, um, a lot of mar good marketing with in vivo, a lot, of, a lot more sort of communications from in vivo. Um, it forces you, quote unquote, um, to start with hierarchies of data. So you have to do nodes sort of before you can do the codes that go to the nodes. So it sort of is imposing a structure. So it's really good if you know what your codes are in advance. So if you're doing more of a traditional, what I call post-positivist study, where you come in with some ideas of your categories, or if you're using survey data, numbers, mixed methods, um, in vivo is really going to support that, whereas you can do it in Atlas TI, but it's a little bit more of a workaround. Max QDA is newer, um, but they really market themselves as the mixed method software. I don't really know what that means, but I know that people find it pretty easy to use. Um, but of course, that's all relative. I always be suspicious when someone says, it's so easy, anybody can use it. I don't think any of these tools are particularly intuitive because they're very powerful. So you really do kind of need to, uh, I think, to, to go through some actual training. I think they're hard to kind of just pick up and use. What's nice about Deduce is it's cloud-based. So if you're doing teamwork, it's $10 a month and it's everything's in the cloud. And people can work on the same project. The other three, you have to really coordinate your teamwork in a very specific way and work on the project separately and merge them later. Deduce had a big PR blow up about a year and a half ago because they, their cloud stuff went down and they lost a bunch of stuff and they didn't retrieve it all. But since then, I think they've come back. I think they've put better security measures in place. Um, a lot of people still use it because it is affordable. Um, and in the cloud. And then Quirkos is sort of claim to fame. It's very simple. It doesn't have a lot of these bells and whistles yet. So if you just have a very simple project, you just want to code, it visually represents the codes in bubbles that get bigger. So people who like the visualization uh, really like Quirkos. Um, so that's just kind of a quick and dirty sort of assessment, and I'm happy to you know stick around after and ask any uh, answer any specific questions you might have. A good starting point is the Cactus Networking Project from the University of Surrey. Um, they were a grant-funded project in the UK for years that did a lot of training and research and information providing about the different tools. They're no longer funded in the same way, so you'll notice when you go to the site that not all of the information is as current as you might expect, but it's still a really good starting point um, for learning more about those tools. So, for example, um, we talked a little bit with Sandra and David and I about the LibQual data and how a program like Atlas TI might be able to help you do something a little bit more systematic with the open-ended comments. So all this is is a screenshot that shows when you pull uh, that data into Atlas TI, it automatically pulls it in as a case and it's already coded. And for example, if you want to look more systematically at the text response, um, there were like 1,500 of these cases that came in, you can run a report for all of those um, responses. And so what we did is I did an auto coding for interlibrary. I just wanted to find where they talked about interlibrary. Uh, they talked about it 43 times. I pulled them into a report, and now all of the responses about interlibrary are right there, and now I can go through and systematically analyze them. So really, they're, these software platforms are good data management tools, just in a way to systematically code and retrieve what it is that you're interested in. Um, and again, I would say in vivo, Atlas, and MaxQDA all have the same functionality. They're just designed differently, um, and the theory behind them is slightly different. But you really can't go wrong with an, any of them. They, they all do sort of the same. They, they have the same power once you, once you know how to use them. All right. And then uh, here's a, a, a slide from uh, the study that we did talking about who was using um, uh, Cactus or qualitative data analysis software. Um, and um, 
sort of like to get an idea of how uh, the software is sort of expanding and being used uh, in um, in academia. And around 1993 is actually when the, the concept of Cactus software first started. And then you see in the uh, early 2000s there were some articles. But then by, you know, just a few years ago, the numbers just spiked big time in terms of the number of articles that were cited using in vivo and the number of articles citing using Atlas TI. Um, and again, um, if you refer back to the first slide, a lot of the health sciences, because um, using qualitative data is uh, part of sort of like the rigor of health sciences research in terms of how well are um, drugs working or treatments or therapies working. And they do use interview data, almost a lot of interview data. So uh, in that field, you see a lot of um, use of the software. So it is, it is expanding quite a bit. Let's see what's next. And then Trina's going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, process uh, and use of digital tools across the process. So that's my book, and I have a copy of it here, my self-promotion here. I don't know if we have it in the library here or not. Oh, hey, thank you. Hooray. Okay. And one of my, one of my arguments in the, in the book is that, uh, and my co-authors, Jessica and Paul, is that when people think of technology and qualitative research, they immediately think data analysis software. But actually, digital tools are important across not just the qualitative research process, but as you all know, probably more than a lot of people, any research process, qualitative or quantitative, starting from um, thinking about ethical approaches to dealing with data in this digital age and as a qualitative researcher, especially because we're so intimately involved in the analysis process, acknowledging our own biases, our own assumptions, where we're coming from as researchers. And there are tools that can support that. Skype, Adobe Connect, Blackboard Collaborate, different ways of collaborating with people. All of these sites like academia.edu and ResearchGate, all these ways to connect, Google Scholar. Uh, a, a good understanding of that's really important too for new researchers. The reviewing the literature. Um, how do you keep it all digital or at what point do you go to paper and how do you help design workflows for budding researchers to deal with the fact that so much is digital. Then of course generating data with mobile phones um, and the big data in social media to how we transcribe. There are great new tools out there that, that really have changed the transcription process. Analyzing not just textual data but multimedia data, the new tools for that. And then there are different ways that we can represent findings in more meaningful ways and reach a broader audience if we're reporting our findings on Twitter as well as in journal articles. So there's a lot of ways. And so we try to um, bring all of that together in the research process. And I'm actually teaching my class on digital tools for qualitative research as an online class this summer if anybody's interested um, or know people who might be, you could tell them about that. Um, it feels appropriate to be the first time I've taught this class online, but it sort of seems appropriate, right? The digital tools class needs to be taught online, so we'll see, to reach a broader audience, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, so just as an example, um, David and I are working on a paper with a couple of my former students um, who are done now, but they really convinced me to go completely paperless in my own literature review process, which I did. It was very painful. Um, once you, because the way you deal with um, the literature is very much intertwined with how you think and how you analyze. And so shifting from paper-based to electronic is really painful because it requires you to retrain your brain. But we've come up with this process of, you know, you've got all these PDF articles or you've got sections of books that you can now store in cloud, in cloud storage. And then you can sync that these days with your citation management system, be it Mendeley, Zotero, EndNote. Um, and then you can actually use the apps, like Mendeley has an app. And it was really once I got an iPad that I went paperless because I would just highlight with my finger. I could write and type. I could do all the same things to the articles on the, pa the tablet that I could on paper. But I didn't want it. For some reason, it didn't work on my laptop. I had to do it on a tablet. You can annotate all of these, come up with some good ideas for what you think your literature review needs to look like. You can flatten all those annotations onto the PDFs, upload it back into cloud storage, and then pull it into InVivo or Atlas TI because that is qualitative data, right? A literature review is qualitative data analysis. You're looking for patterns and themes across all of these text documents. So InVivo and Atlas TI especially have been promoting this idea of using the software for literature reviews. Um, and then that's a, a, a more systematic way not only to store and organize stuff, but to analyze it in a, in a meaningful way. And then the other, um, the other sort of big 
a push, I think, is that Max QDA is really promoting using your phone for data collection in the field. So you don't have to haul around video cameras so much anymore when you're doing field work. These software platforms all have apps, so you can immediately reflect on your data, take pictures, take pictures of text, enter in your field notes, record audio reflections, and you can code, you can geotag it, and then you can upload all of that once you get back to your desktop, if you want to even work on a desktop, but it's usually easier. Upload all of that, your first round of analysis is complete, then you can keep working. And so I think that the way that mobile phones and that we're all, like, like one author I read said, we're all walking around with computers in our pockets, very, very powerful computers, uh, and putting that to use for research uh, is, is another big innovation with digital tools for qualitative research. So to get, st we were trying to think of what some takeaways would be in terms of, you know, getting started if you wanted to start doing some qualitative research or think about what the possibilities are. One is just to find some interesting, you know, of course this is everybody's least favorite thing to do, but uh, at least my students, probably not you guys because you're librarians, so you like to read interesting in all of your spare time, right? But I think the most interesting ideas come from reading what's already been done. You know, what, what have people been doing or what haven't they been doing? Um, and it can spark some ideas for what might be important in your, in your area. I highly recommend working with others. I do almost all of my research collaboratively. It's just the, the give and take of ideas that keeps you accountable. Like David mentioned, you're dealing with massive quantities of data, so the more eyes you have on it and the more help you have figuring out how to organize it, the better. Um, and then just figuring out what context, I always tell students, you know, like, well, what, what is my research question? I'm like, well, with qualitative research, you're either interested in a place or people. <laughs> and, or maybe how language is used in documents is sort of the third thing, um, communication pattern. So that's what you, you know, if that's what you're interested in, then probably qualitative research is a good, is a good option for you. Um, also, I think that there are advantages to not going to big data immediately, but to start small um, to give you some idea of what's there and then po possibly you can scale up. And if you already have a bunch of data, I would I suggest doing data sessions, which is the conversation analysis term for bringing that data in with a group of people and just going around and looking and talking through what you think you're seeing there uh, and wh what direction you might wanna go. There's a lot of, a lot of power in that. Um, okay, so some ways to learn more. There's actually a qualitative research summer intensive in Chapel Hill every year at the end of July with lots of different topics uh, on everything from just designing a qualitative study to how to do interviews. I'll be doing a workshop on digital tools this summer as well as on analyzing online talk. Uh, the qualitative report is not only a conference every January, but they have a great daily, weekly newsletter. Sometimes I feel like it comes out every day. A newsletter of recent publications, um, jobs in qualitative research, conferences that are coming up. It gives you a really good lay of the land about what's going on in, across a lot of different fields. The International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry is every May in, at the University of Illinois. Again, lots of different fields represented, lots of varieties of really innovative qualitative research. And we mentioned the, the Cactus Networking Project at the University of Surrey. Um, and then David recommended the, the Atlas TI and in vivo YouTube channels. And I would say that the, the <laughs> my students told me this, and it's true, you can't get away from Twitter. Um, these companies are really have a huge Twitter presence. So if you really want to know what's going on with the, the digital tool side of things, you got everything is on Twitter. And then they may, they may point you over to YouTube for some of the more detailed videos. And then I just thought I would spend a couple minutes just, and again, the brochures are back there, just we, I guess the, the new news for us over in Rivers Crossing is that our graduate certificate is fully online now. Um, and so we, we are starting cohorts every fall. Um, and even though the application deadline's passed, if anybody's interested, we may still be, you know, open to taking new people for the fall. Um, it's asynchronous and synchronous, so we have some synchronous Adobe Connect sessions, but a lot of it's asynchronous using the ELC platform. Um, our, our graduate, we've got five professors over there, and we're the ones teaching the online courses. We've got students from lots of different disciplines, a lot from public health, and it's just fascinating. Like David said, I mean, that public health medicine has really been taking up qualitative research in the last few years in a big way. Very interactive, engaging courses, and it's designed to be completed in two years, uh, and I think 
The core course is a qualitative research foundations class about the underlying philosophies of qualitative research. The next class is on research design and data collection, and the third class is on uh, methods for analyzing data. Then you take two elective courses um, and then do a, 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 a three-credit hour course where you actually do a research project. Um, so again, I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Um, and I think that's all we have. So we have time for any questions you might have. Thank you.